Oh, but my computer's telling me it's 631. So why don't we call the meeting to order? Uh, could, could I have a motion for the adoption of remote participation? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Um, uh, no, if there is no discussion, let's <clears throat> move to a roll call. Pam Sackton, yes. Michael Ruderman Arlington, yes. Uh, Steve Ledoux Concord, yes. Ford Spalding Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone Lancaster, yes. Judy Crocker Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen Needham, yes. Alice Tulu Castor, yes. Okay. So I challenge to remember the alphabet at the beginning of these meetings. Well, as people come in, I put them in alphabetical order on my screen. So that's as my long screen. as Steve is there, I'm happy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and Dave will Dave is not, so that's screwing me up. <laughs> right, right. So and, and I count on Ford, so Ford, you have to be here. <laughs> well, see, that's how we, we all rely on each other in so many ways, big and small. Um, under the chair's report, I have a couple of things. Um, so first of all, it seems like a long time since we met, um, but you know, I guess it is only, it's that it's been a very um, an eventful time. Um, and I wanna take a minute to acknowledge the um, attack on the Capitol last week. You know, none of us live work, go to school um, in isolation and things that happen in our communities and our country affect all of us. And I know from my own experience in talking to um, the people I work with and the students that they work with that, you know, that there has been a, a really high level of anxiety, you know, higher than usual over over the past week that everyone's been um, acknowledging and I, that everyone's been experiencing. And I, I did wanna take a moment right now to really acknowledge the um, you know, Minuteman um, administration, faculty for the really high level of social emotional support that you offer in the school. You know, it's important all the time but it's especially important right now. So it is much appreciated. Um, a couple of other announcements are on January 6th will be our budget hearing um, and school committee meeting. So, you know, make sure that you have, that's two weeks from today. So make sure you have marked your calendar. I also want to um, just call attention to the um, school committee meeting norms that are in your packet. These were adopted about 10 years ago by the school committee. They're in the packet for review and we will be referring to them and having a discussion about them at our next meeting. But uh, you know, I did wanna just call your attention to that. Okay, anything else for the good of the organization? Okay, let's move to superintendent's report. School building committee report, Ford. I'll give the uh, building committee report and then um, I can turn it over to Ed for, to uh, just give an update. Well, I can give an update on the uh, contract also. Um, in terms of the school building uh, progress, we actually have 11 items that need to be completed. Um, and uh, when they are completed, uh, we should be able to get our certificate of occupancy for the theater. We have the certificate of occupancy for the building, but it's the certificate of occupancy for the theater that's being held up. And the 11 items, don't ask questions, but the 11 items all have to do with outdoor work that needs to be done by Dow um, that Gilbane is working on. And Lincoln is holding it up until those are satisfied um, and that's where we are as of this moment. We are trying to see if uh, we can um, move it forward, but the 11 items may not be done until next April um, because we have frozen ground out there and they all are involved in moving uh, some earth around and planting grass 
And the last we knew is the grass had to be grown before this could happen. So that's my update. Um, and um, we are just as happy as can be as we move along. Um, in terms of the athletic fields, um, the um, our construction manager uh, has all done all the demo work that was still resided on the on the place, which is just removing some things and they're stripping loam uh, right now. They're nearing the end of that and they're stockpiling it. Um, the other issue that we're dealing with, uh, which we will resolve, is is the Cambridge Water um, Association, whatever commission, uh, along with Lincoln, wants us to remark the borderline uh, for the town so we do not take down any trees that uh, uh, we should not take down. Um, and uh, that is uh, about to be done. So we're moving along. We're on budget, we're on time, and that's good. Um, we did have a meeting today uh, to look at the PV contract. We have it. Uh, there are a few items there that need to be uh, taken care of, and we would hope that in the next two, at the next meeting in two weeks, uh, on January 26, uh, we will get it out ahead of time and we can vote to approve it. I don't know, if, Ed, if you have anything else you want to add to that. Now, in your packet, uh, you had a presentation on the PV project update. Um, it, it's boiling down to a couple of very, you know, unlikely events, but in the event that we don't pay the bill or something. And then the other um, issue that was really needs a little bit more work and we needed to refine it today was uh, snow removal, <clears throat> especially in a, in a, you know, a snowmageddon kind of situation how that would happen, who it would do it, because they own the asset, but we would be working with them um, to remove snow from around the installation. And we came to a reasonable conclusion today, but it wasn't codified in the contract. <clears throat> and I didn't want to send you a contract. They apologize for being late with it. It'll probably be done by the end of the week. Uh, and then we'll send it out so you have a chance to read. It's typical contract language but um, but in regards to the project itself if any members had any questions about the project if you recall the real value in this project is our getting lead certification which qualifies us for um, reimbursement points that we've always counted on since the beginning but those reimbursement points are about two million dollars uh, the annual savings from the project are estimated to be fairly minor, I think, twenty-four to thirty-eight thousand um, dollars, and there, you know, there's a new climate bill in the state that the governor has yet to sign. But once that is signed, it's to our benefit in this contract. And so, I think there was some discussion amongst the lawyers and the contractor around that to be clear, be clear about the, the value to the district once the climate bill is signed. So it makes sense to just wait a couple of weeks and uh, put our stamp on it. Jennifer? So actually, I have a question about the occupancy of the theater back to Ford's oh, report. Okay. Um, does that prevent us from, I mean, I know kids are in for shop. Does that prevent them from getting into the theater altogether? It has not so far. Okay. Um, I did express my concern at the construction meeting today about liability. And I sent, <clears throat> I sent our attorney and our insurance person a, a, a question, uh, you know, what, what's the status of a temporary CO versus a CO versus a temporary C certificate of occupancy that has expired. Um, so I'm, I'm working with the attorney and the insurance folks around that. It has not impacted the program at all, okay. but we're certainly not using the, the today, for instance, our final uh, AV package came in, uh, which was our the new cameras and, and all that stuff. So uh, we haven't utilized the theater fully, I mean, if we were in a non-COVID environment, I think this would be a pretty serious issue. 
Um, but it's Lincoln's. <clears throat> yeah, I'll just stop there. <laughs> I just I want to make sure it wasn't impacting the the kids in in their. No. I mean, I, I, we're in a COVID situation, so I guess if you're going to have this, it's the best possible scenario because what's your option, right? That's the positive way to look. At it. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I just want to make sure that the the kids weren't being isolated. You know, prevented no, from using the space. it's not impacting kids at all right now. It's yeah, only impacting you. a few people at this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, shall we move on to enrollment? Yeah, uh, Jeff, uh, I think Jeff needs to share his screen too. Uh, I do, briefly. So I'm going to do that if I can. Uh, let's see if I can find the right one. Here we go. So uh, can you see that? Yep. Okay. So um, uh, as we mentioned uh, at our last meeting, we believe that it is appropriate based on the type of work that we are doing to more formalize the operations of the enrollment task force into a full school committee. And I have for your uh, delight a motion here that I am uh, uh, presenting and I'll read it. Uh, I move that the enrollment task force shall be dissolved. A new subcommittee, the Communication Access and Admissions Subcommittee, CAA, shall be formed. The CAA will adopt the goals of the enrollment task force. And I would like somebody to move that so we can uh, put it on the um, uh, so discussion. Second. Okay. So um, we explained this last time. Uh, I should mention that uh, at our last meeting, which was just last night, there were uh, two items that we spent considerable time on. One was the idea of how we could allow enrollment of up to 800 students, which is something we've discussed before. And how can we best uh, communicate with our towns so that all towns are taking appropriate advantage of the Minuteman option, which they don't, don't do. So we continue to work on those items and by uh, changing this from a task force to a subcommittee, then I think we will have um, more credibility moving forward. And eventually there should be a formal presentation probably by the administration on ideas of how to meet um, an 800 member school. And I'm gonna suggest that to Ed in the near future. In the meantime, uh, any discussion or comments on uh, uh, this motion that we've put on the table? Can't see everybody like this. Um, I can see everyone, Jeff. Okay, good. Um, let's see, any, uh, any questions, comments? It does not seem like we do. So let's move to a roll call vote. Uh, Pam Nosakton, yes. Michael Ruderman Arlington, yes. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Ford Spalding Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone Lancaster, yes. Judy Crocker, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulin Needham, yes. Alice Salukas, Joe, yes. And I would, um, so the motion carries unanimously. And I would like to say that um, Jeff has agreed to be the chair of the new CAA subcommittee. So I think that we're going to have some very interesting stuff for you, uh, uh, things that come from the membership and also um, Ed Boquillen's leadership is going to be directly responsible for some of the interesting things we're going to be talking about. I'm very, very happy where we're going right now. I think you will be too. Thank you. That's the end of the enrollment report. Any questions on the enrollment report overall? Okay. Let's move on to principal's report. You missed the communications update. Oh, I'm sorry. I did miss the communications update. Um, and well, Dan also, if I may, Madam Chair, <laughs> I sent uh, in the packet you received the preliminary slot allocation formula. Um, and I just wanted to give you an overview of that. Um, beginning last year, under the new admissions policy, there's an admissions committee that every year submits to the school committee 
a slot allocation um, formula. Last year we did it in March. This year I wanted to kind of get uh, get discussing it a little bit earlier. And last night at the enrollment subcommittee, we spent some time looking at it. And uh, I looked at it some more this morning. And let me back up again. In the admissions policy, there's no prescribed methodology for doing it. But one of the things that came out, and if you looked at the, that, um, that chart, uh, it's, it, it's, some parts of it didn't make sense, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, let me just see here. Oh, am I sharing something? Stop, stop that. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> right here. Anyway, the, the last year we used this methodology, which was a four-year rolling average, which aligns with how we um, a, how we uh, allocate the capital assessment to our member towns. And in that formula, there is a minimum a minimum contribution, if you will, or a, a, an equal contribution from each town. So last year we tried to infuse that um, that theology into the mix. But when you look at it this year, it, it really didn't make sense. And um, uh, so we looked at a couple other methodologies and one I sent to the enrollment subcommittee this afternoon was just looking at the last two years of enrollment versus the last four years. Because year three and four, I, I think they're kind of skewing the, the process a little bit. So um, I'm gonna send out another one and uh, we'll look at that minimum slot allocation again. I think there's only one, you know, uh, yeah, in this, Dover had four students here on October 1, 2003. And under the previous thing, uh, they would get two slots and maybe that's not enough. We wouldn't want Dover to get shortchanged if they had five kids. So maybe we'll come up with a five minimum or something like that. I, I hope I'm confusing you enough because, <laughs> but but the idea is that we want to look at what would the slot allocation formula be with for 200 freshmen. Um, and so we're going to work that a little bit more so that it's a an equal thing. And we actually have more applications from our member towns than we do uh, slots right now. So uh, okay. Jennifer. So yeah, yeah I just. I... I know this has been a thing I've said a number of times. Lancaster is sending disproportionately massive numbers of their eighth grade students. I mean, it's it's twenty percent at I think in the at least in the junior class it was twenty percent. So for us, I mean, I I want kids to be able to go, but the what's happening to our budget because of the Minuteman part of it is I think it's currently 5% of our budget is just Minuteman, which for 50 kids is a lot for us to swallow. I don't feel a lot of pushback from the town, but I think this is something that I would like to encourage the slot allocation to kind of try to encourage other towns to fill in some of those spots. I don't wanna deny Lancaster kids but I don't want Lancaster kids to fill in additional slots. I guess that's my. Well, Jeff can, can uh, you know, emphasize, we spent a lot of time talking about a few communities that are underperforming when it comes to the percentage of eighth graders applying and enrolling. And we are, you know, the way to solve that, I think, is to get everyone contributing on a more equal basis and participating on a more equal basis. Well, uh, I guess one of the things is that one of the concerns I had when I was talking to my, or that was raised when I was talking to my, my finance committee was that if we increase the population, the ability to have students at Minuteman, mm -hmm. then in Lancaster students are disproportionately encouraged to go or, or you know, want to go are we going to fill, you know, are we going to go to 60? I mean, are we going to go to 65? I, it's the town is looking at an override this year just to balance its budget. So 
I'd like to figure out a way that we can, I don't want to deny kids this opportunity. I mean, it's fabulous and it's, and I support it completely, but there is some point where the Lancaster budget can't support it. And I hate that fact. I wish the state could support uh, vocational education better than it does, but you know, we don't, we don't have, the fiscal means of some of the other member communities. So that's that's just where we're where we are right now. Thank you. Okay. Um Jeff had his hand up as well. So I'm actually going to add a second comment to respond to what I just heard, which is very understandable. Uh, one of the uh, motivations for increasing the school to 800 actually when we first started act was the fact that we are losing out of district students who could reduce, you know, tuition, uh, member tuition and member assessments. So one of the motivations for going to a larger school is to not lose that students, have them come in and to reduce member town assessment. So that's actually where that idea started, as well as we don't want to close out district students who do want to come. So uh, you're, I understand your concerns 100%, you're not wrong, uh, but that is one of, one of our goals. And the original comment I was gonna make was, uh, in the event we, st we start to deny slots to students from member towns who wanna come, then we should have a uh, actual policy on how the slot allocation works, because otherwise we'll be said you're being arbitrary. So I think it's time to develop a, uh, a written policy of how slot allocation works that we can change every year. So we can say, this is our initial policy to do it. We, don't, we really cannot anticipate all the uh, challenges in doing this, but here's how we're gonna start is written and be, be forewarned that we're probably gonna change this in a year or two once we have a little bit more history with it. But I think we should have a written policy on it to avoid um, in the event we do have to um, uh, disallow students from coming within the district and people get angry at us. That's it. Thank you. Alice. Back on mute. You're off mute now. Now you're on mute. I think. Um, Alice, you're on mute. Can someone unmute me? Um, you are unmuted now. Okay. Um, there's another meeting going on in my house. And so my bandwidth is messed up, I think. Sorry. Um, I have um, <clears throat> just back when we started the uh, slot allocation method, the reason for it was to make sure that each town had a minimum number of slots. It wasn't designed for filling the school. It was to ensure that no town didn't have any kids in the school. So it was originally designed for like 25% of the class here's how we would fill 25% of the class, make sure every town has at least some seats. That, that was the origin of it. And I believe referencing Jeff's point that last March or so, I think um, Ed and his administration did develop a document that it was about how they would go through and assign seats. So um, I think that the problem with the current thing that was in the packet has to do with trying to apply that type of slot allocation method to filling the whole 200 seats, um, ex extrapolating from, you know, a smaller number of kids into 200 and not looking at what is the minimum guaranteed number of slots. And I think that's why it ends up it punishing the Lancasters and the Stowe's accidentally because it's being used for a different purpose. Any other questions or comments? So we will be revisiting this, you know, at our next meeting. Um, Ed, you were about to say something? 
Uh, no, we will revisit it again. And uh, Dan, did you want me to share the um, the update and you can speak to it? Sure. Okay. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay. Um, go ahead, Dan. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for um, letting me do this uh, brief presentation. Uh, Dr. B just asked me to give a brief update on the communications and marketing work for the school year so far. Um, the beginning of the year, um, I put out a, a survey for parents and for students um, just on how they consume media and um, the, the short reason for that was we were thinking about doing some digital ads. We weren't sure of the best platforms. So I just thought this was useful um, just because the, you know, what we consume uh, for media just changes um, pretty rapidly. Um, so this just gives a kind of confirming what we already knew, which is where the students are on social media um, of um, the number one uh, app that they used, which was a tie, was Snapchat and TikTok. Um, and number two was Instagram. Um, on the flip side, the parents, um, the overwhelming majority uh, said Facebook. And um, number two was Instagram. Um, let me just actually bring up. Uh, Can you see it? Yeah, it was 64% Facebook. Um, so it's just sort of a you know reminder of of you know where to meet folks, um, you know where they're consuming their media. Um, I'm not advocating at all for a Snapchat um, or anything like that, but um, it's good. It's good to know. The other point that I thought was important was where they heard about Minuteman, um, and and the overwhelming said it was from a middle school uh, presentation. Um, so that just sort of reinforces the work that um, Anthony's doing. We also did some advertising, um, really small advertising. Uh, we did, Anthony um, oversaw the um, direct mailing of five um, mailers that went to uh, folks in the member towns. We did some really small money, um, just targeted ads online um, during the recruitment season. We did an ad in the Colonial Times. We did an ad um, that's playing at the drive-in event in Lexington through uh, Revolution Food Hall. Um, so Anthony and I have been working closely on those things. Um, we've been uh, putting out, um, as you probably know, an electronic newsletter. Um, so this is being sent to about 5,400 email addresses that we have. Uh, so that includes all students, faculty, staff, parents, uh, prospective parents, and then um, a wide swath of alumni and stakeholders, whether those are um, people on the advisory board and businesses. Um, it's doing pretty well. I, I really am a big, my nerd communication role, all the places I've worked, I've been a big proponent of the electronic newsletters. I, I think it's actually sometimes more effective than social media. It goes right into people's inboxes. Um, they have to at least look at it. Um, so uh, we're doing pretty well with about 35% or, or so um, opening, <laughs> just opening, which is what we want. So, so we're doing okay with that. Can I can um, I butt in for just one second? Of Have you are you sending this to the select boards? Um, I think so. Um, I think for the, the I think context, that might be helpful. Yeah, definitely. I'm sending it to the town managers. Um, and the last, yeah. So I'll I'll double check that. I'm I'm pretty sure it's hitting some of them, but probably hasn't been updated um in a few months. So I'll look at that. Well, and they and they, they change every election cycle, so that's sure. you know, something you guys. <laughs> you got to keep track of, um, but I think that would be really helpful for the board of selectmen and even, you know, it, depending on the town. But at least if the finance director has it, that would be good too. Hundred percent agree. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, just really briefly, I think you guys all saw the videos we put out. Um, we did three professional videos, um, which got really great um, responses, and and I think. Uh, for, for different, slightly different purposes. Uh, one was reopening, um, you know, in a COVID environment. The other was um, just a marketing video and, um, and then also the video tour of the building. I just also want to briefly give a shout out to um, the multimedia students. Hold on one second, I apologize. 
my dog's at my feet here. Um, <laughs> the uh, so uh, Jack Ly Lyburn and Drew O'Connor's their students um, put together these really great three minute vignettes um, on each of the shops, and I know uh, Anthony was. Um, instrumental in, in that as well. And those have been really great um, student produced marketing tools. Um, and also uh, the parents I think really liked uh, the video of George's, uh, George Clement's daily announcements on Fridays. He does what's called the high five Friday, which I think is really great to sort of lift everybody's spirits. Everybody's giving shout outs to one another on some of the nice things or the good work they did for the week. Um, and I know that was a big hit with parents as well. Um, I won't go through all these, but these are just, this is just a list of the press we got mostly in, you know, the very local small town newspaper level. Um, we did get a mention in the Globe West, I think, um, for something, but, um, you know, that's just an ongoing process. And, you know, I'm a former reporter, media relations person, so this is pretty easy for me to do, um, to just push out this anytime we have a good story. Um, just internally, um, you know, in the COVID environment, the communications really stepped up, um, whether it's, um, you know, trying to reinforce um, or thank people for following protocols, wearing masks, um, any sort of, um, you know, message from the nurse's office, et cetera. Uh, we're posting all the letters to the website. Um, so they're always in one place. And uh, we also uh, are sending translation notices to, I think we have about 11 uh, students who uh, their native language is in, uh, at home is not English. Um, this is just a very quick overview of um, social media audiences over the last year and just where we've picked up followers. Um, Facebook, we've seen about a 17% increase. Instagram, a, a really, big percentage, 59% increase. Um, since that's what seems to be a, a, a strong um, medium for both parents and students. Um, and then Twitter seen a, a small increase. Um, we don't, we have about 465 followers. Um, this is just an age breakdown, which I think is always a good reminder. I think for me as someone in my late thirties, I tend to think everybody's on Facebook and I have to remind myself our students are, are not always on Facebook, but our parents are. Um, also, there's a gender breakdown. It's a little bit more skewed towards uh, females versus males. Um, I won't go through these, but this is just a quick uh, list of our top uh, posts on Facebook. Facebook has a lot better um, uh, data on who our users are uh, over the other platforms. So I like to just kind of see what people are interested in. One of the quick themes I, I just found is that we, we have a really engaged group of parents and alumni that love to share or help out if they can. A lot of these um, were posts for an open house or a parent info session um, or, you know, showing off the tour of the new building or, you know, kids selling these Christmas trees they made in the metal fab shop. Um, and it was, it just shows that we have a really positively engaged uh, group of folks that follow us. Um, and just very briefly, um, you know, the, the Minuteman Parent Association has been uh, uh, really stepping up um, and engaging with us uh, this year. And uh, George, Anthony, and I, and Dr. B, we've all, um, you know, attended some of their virtual meetings. And uh, George especially has taken a lot of questions from parents um, and then just, just communicating with them. Um, you know, in the COVID environment, it's more important than ever to have that two-way communication and feedback. Um, you know, Dr. B said he wants to do another town hall meeting. Um, so we're looking at that soon. Um, we had one that, um, I, I want to say we had what, like 500 people on it, uh, oh, yeah. 400 over people. 400 and 200 questions. That was in September. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. So this is, you know, just a brief update on, on what's been going on and, um, you know, happy to share this and answer any questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Dan. Very, very impressive. Um, let's see, Ford. Yeah, I really don't have a question because you answered most of them, Dan, because I didn't see Twitter on the first one. And I think it's important that you, you're on that. Um, yeah. um, I, I think you do a great job. You almost have a post on Facebook almost every day, if not maybe four times a week. I, I think you're doing a fantastic job there. 
and I know the films have all been great. But so I think, you know, you just got to keep doing what you're doing. I'm tr I was trying to sit here and think, what else can you do? Um, and I think you're doing it. I really do. And uh, I think maybe you want to make sure that the somehow get the guidance people and the admissions uh, and the uh, administrators in the various middle schools um, connected to this information going out all the time. Uh, if you can get their emails, I think that would be important. Um, so, but, you know, I think, I think you're doing it. Just try to reach out to the communities. Um, you're on, I was just thinking, you're on the Dover website, but that only takes you to the to the um, to the web page, uh, you know. Somehow, if, I bet if you ask somebody like Dover if they could print a story, they might do it on their website, and maybe other towns yep. would. Um, I guess all you can do is ask, and the worst answer you'll get is no. Absolutely. All right. That's it. Thank you for it. Uh, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. This was this was great. Thank you so much, Dan. This is a lot of effort, a lot of work, um, and you know you've got the numbers to show the trend. So, so all good stuff. Um, thank you for mentioning the Colonial Times in uh, Lexington. It's a type of because it goes to every household and it's free. Um, usually, the the editors there they'll take any press release you have, even if they don't publish it. If you just keep feeding it to them. Um, it's, it's a good way to get some press in, but a different, um, something a little different. Um, most of the communities have, um, some type of local media, you know, cable vision, whatever it might be. So, um, I know a lot of nonprofits or schools that leave in, even if it looks like a flyer, they can just post that. So whether mm -hmm. it be the Vizios, you can push them as a PSA or, um, you know, just a, you know, so it's, it's like, it's on the screen for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you yep. know, so just something different, a different. Yeah, medium. thank you for that suggestion. I'll definitely look into that. Thank you, but great job. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Okay, have Michael then Ford. Yeah, Dan, uh, echoing the others, great job. Um, are we in touch with enough uh, graduates that we can feature uh, one of them from time to time in the stuff that we send out to? Um, well, I've, I've always thought our kids are our best advertisement and, and the successes that, that, they, uh, that they come by. Um, is, is that something we could possibly do? Uh, absolutely, and uh, we're doing it. Uh, we made sure we had alumni in the marketing video um, and in every newsletter that's going out, there's um, an alumni feature uh, in there. So that's you, great. So yeah, but thank you. That's, that's an excellent uh, point. Sure. Okay, Ford. Yeah, the only thing I want to follow up is what Judy mentioned is, is I think um, anything that's like five minutes long or, or longer, or send it to the cable television stations. You know, they're begging for stuff right now. I know they're they're doing a lot of all their sports and all that that are going on, but you know, I would just send it to them. Uh, I think they'll put it on. Um, like Dover Sherman uh, Cable Television. I think I'm sure they would put it on. If they don't, let me know. No, thank you. Um, and actually, um, uh, Michael, we are working with the Arlington uh, ACMI. Uh, they came in and did a story on the Food Link uh, partnership the other day. But um, I appreciate the cable because sometimes I don't think of that. So I, I do appreciate the suggestion and we'll definitely uh, try to get some more announcements out um, that they can post. Yeah, glad to facilitate that. Yeah, thank you again. Um. Let's see, Steve, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add in terms of the cable since, you know, virtually every town has, a, has public access. And as everybody said, they're looking for programming. Not only are they looking for programming, they tend to show the, 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 the same programs over and over again. So you, if you can't sleep at two in the morning, you know, you might even <laughs> be able to see a Minuteman video at that point. So, you know, it, it does get a complete coverage in the town and, and a lot of people watch it. I was always surprised when I was a town manager, how many people said, hey, I watched you on a meeting. And I said, why? Why are you doing that? But, you know, a lot of people do watch. Absolutely. You had the superintendent of Minuteman with you. <laughs> I did that one. That's right. We had a few of those. <laughs> 
Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, um, thank you all for the support. And um, just wanna say again, I work really closely with George, Anthony and Ed who've all been, and Amy who have all been really supportive of this work, so thank you. Um, okay. Jennifer, I was trying to see if you were raising your hand or stretching. <laughs> okay. My husband just got home. I just was saying hi. <laughs> um, any, Ed, anything else under the superintendent's report? Okay. It's George is up. Yep. Principal report. Hey, first item up there is school climate. I think it, I think it continues to be uh, okay. You know, I, I would describe it. Um, we really appreciated the, the vacation. I think people really needed it. Um, there continues to be a lot of support for the schedule change that we made. Um, and I think I reported this last time, but it's becoming more of a reality that we really want to, that is something, the facilitated support time that we've created is something we want to keep. Well, even when we go back, you know, full in person. That's, uh, mm -hmm. So we've been talking about how we're gonna manage that structure, what that's gonna look like, but it's really been a, a hit as far as all the faculty is concerned. And I think the kids are taking full advantage of it. We're all feeling very good about that. Um, kids are more productive. We're making more connections with teachers. Obviously we had the um, incident in DC last week uh, and our, our faculty again did an outstanding job processing the issues with kids. And, you know, from talking to some kids and, and um, and faculty, it's, you know, it, the, the student response is really, uh, I think kind of typical of, of teenagers. You know, you had some, I heard some teachers talking about they had the most profound discussions they've ever had, you know, about life and civics and, you know, all sorts of things. And, you know, I had other teachers say, you know, my, my you know, my group, they just, we, we talked about it for very, very briefly and they just really weren't, you know, their kids are like, yeah, what can we get to work? We don't really, how does it, you know, so that's kind of the joy of being 16 sometimes, you know, it doesn't really, um, and especially for these kids, I don't know how many more times we can use the word unprecedented and have it mean anything anymore for them, you know, but, but, um, but we got through eight, that. Eight think, more days. <laughs> I said, you only need it for eight more days, I think. Yeah. So we, we got through it pretty well. I think I, the professionalism, um, is uh, remarkable amongst all the amongst all the faculty and how they handle that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think we're experiencing a little mask fatigue at the t at this time. You know, I, I, we've uh, Brian and I have been doing some more rounds to make sure that kids are wearing masks. Um, I don't know if it's just a sophomore class which we've had a couple weeks in a row coming in. Maybe it's just that. Um, it just. But I think that's probably also, you could say that everywhere. I mean, who isn't really a little tired of wearing the mask and whatever else? But I think that's just, just, just the general kind of malaise that you, I think we're all feeling, you know, we're all kind of struggling with that a bit. So um, my, my sense of climate is that it's it's good, it's okay. You know, we're, we're hanging on better days, you know? <laughs> we try to do what we can. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions on climate. Uh, Jeff. Just one neurotic observation. <laughs> Whenever I'm done with a Zoom meeting where there's a lot of people, I feel like I have to go and wash my hands, even though I know that I'm not a person. I know I don't have to, but I'm I'm so well trained now. I have to. I just have this urge, and I go do it, even though I know it's crazy. So that's where we'll, that's where our mindset is now. And mm -hmm. uh, God bless the kids and the teachers who are are still doing a good job on the masks, despite- Okay, the... now I'm going to wash my hands. What are you doing to me, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, George, I have a question. Have the mask issues, has it gotten so far that it's led to any disciplinary issues or have you been able to manage it? We've been able to manage, you know, we had one student a little, little bit ago that we sent home for refusal to wear a mask, but honestly, it, all the issues had nothing really to do with the mask. You know, the mask is really just a pretext to, you know, to really, as part of a larger meltdown, you know, that we had to deal with. Um, and the kids that uh, we did a sweep the other day, Brian and I, and, you know, reported back to the faculty, there were only two kids that we saw 
and you know, was they were just below the nose. So it wasn't even like they weren't on. You know, it's just and this, you, I could give you a million reasons like they did. Oh, I didn't even. I get it. Fix it. <laughs> you know, and we reminded the faculty that you know if they are experiencing any chronic issues, to please send them down, and we will make it a disciplinary issue as if we need to. But my, you know, my sense is it's good. You know, I'll, I'll hear things that it's you know. It, I saw a kid, there's somebody over here or there. We, we, we try to respond. We can't be everywhere at once. I don't know, but my, my sense is that it's pretty good, I, I think. Although, you know, I do think it's people are getting tired, which is why last week we heard more of like, hey, I'm concerned about a kid I saw in the hallway without a mask walking down the hall. Okay, well, we'll, we'll address it. That's what we'll do. Um, as far as the, the hybrid model goes, you know, we continue to look at it and, um, you know, increasing in-person learning. There, there are just so many moving parts with that. I, I, I think Dr. B is right. I mean, we're looking, you know, we're looking, it, it's hard sometimes to sift through all the data with increasing rates of infection. And at the same time, we're talking about bringing more people in and how that will impact. I, so right now we're, we're sort of just scratching around what it could look like. Um, we, know we, we know we would need subs, but there's so many things that we don't know will change. In starting with, you know, it starts with fundamental issues. Can we fill a bus? Because if we don't, that will impact the schedule. And when you impact the schedule, you're impacting curriculum and instruction. Um, what are the gonna rules be around cohorting? Are they the same or are they gonna, are we going to see a change maybe as the as the vaccine gets out? You know, because again, that will impact curriculum and instruction. So it's 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 a little hard to get too far ahead of yourself as you know that the situation is constantly changing. So you know, I'm having those discussions. We're, we're talking about things, but we're you know, we'll wait and see. I really, really am hoping this vaccine will get out and distributed, and I think that that's the ultimate game changer. Really, that's what we need to, to alleviate everyone's anxiety. And there is anxiety out there. I can tell you that we've, we've doubled the amount of kids that are going full remote learning. You know, we were a little under 3%. Now we're a little over 6%, you know? So this can, you know, so as one, one parent will say, how come I can't get in more? And I have another saying, you know what? I'm just not comfortable anymore. Yeah, I get it. So we, we continue to just, you know, do our best to see, and when the time is right, we will execute. Um, George, I saw a couple of hands. Um, I have Jeff, then Michael. Okay, so I understand why people want to move to a hybrid model, and we are moving to hybrid flexible model in Newton. Hybrid flex is when you have you know, students participating both remotely and in person, so you can actually teach to all the kids at once. And uh, uh, just a few words of caution. One is that, and this was presented to the school committee, moving from full remote to a high flex model means that uh, there is a, a, a significant hit in the amount of teaching that can occur. So there are all sorts of um, issues in, in, in that kind of program, even implemented beautifully which will reduce the amount of actual content that a teacher can cover. Fully remote is generally more uh, effective with uh, a content. And the other interesting thing is that the scheduling of hybrid flex is so complicated that Newton has said, if you choose to be remote, you can't change your mind because we cannot, we have to, we have to schedule all the classrooms very carefully. Right. We have to schedule which kids are in and which are out. It's a, uh, you'll probably have to hire 10 people just to do the scheduling to make it work right. And the flexibility of changing your mind has to be eliminated because when you're balancing, you know, how many kids can you have in a room at once and all of a sudden those numbers change, it doesn't work anymore. So they're kind of saying that if you twist our arm and you're in person, you want to go uh, fully remote, maybe we'll allow that. But a fully remote person who wants to come in, we're not going to allow it at all. And that also brings up the question of when teachers who are remote for medical or whatever reasons get the vaccine and want to come in, 
that may not be possible to do. Uh, because again, now you've, you've allocated your space to make it safe. Remember, you know, only have X number of kids in a room. Mm -hmm. And so there are all sorts of extremely challenging problems and a big hit to content. I'm looking, even though I'm staying fully remote, I'm looking at the hits that I'm going to take to already reduced content by being remote and dealing with this here. And I'm scratching my head, huh? What else am I going to cut out now? Uh, in the in the next semester, I'm already and that the, the people who are actually teaching in the classroom hybrid, they're going to have to cut out even more. So you have all these issues around it, and I know why some parents and kids want to come in, but the disadvantages beyond safety uh, are enormous, and I, I can tell you that from just personal experience. And thank you, thank you for that, Jeff, because that's you are right, <laughs> one hundred percent. That's been sort of our, our team talking is wondering. I mean, we can do anything you want. I'm not sure it's going to make academics any better at all. It might actually make it worse. I'm not sure. You know, CTE on the other hand, you know, it's kind of pre-cohorted. It's a little bit different. The room space is different we might have a shot of restoring that and that's our core mission. So uh, we could probably, that's a little easier. That still has issues, but not, not nearly what, I mean, academics is just, I, I'm not sure. I agree with, thank you, Jeff, for saying that. And, and the people who are doing the scheduling, the joke, the joke I tell them is that for all those people, they have, they have two big buckets on either side of them. One contains the Excedrin and the other bucket <laughs> contains the Valium. And they go through half a bucket every day because I can't even, even though being a computer guy and used to doing this sort of thing, I can't even imagine the challenges of scheduling this to keep it uh, safe. And God bless you and your team really for, yep. uh, for dealing with this. Yep. Hey, thank you, Michael. Sure, uh, George, thank you for uh, describing um, the complexity and the extent of what you're dealing with. Could I ask, to, to, to the amount that you're able to, uh, can, can you give us an update from time to time, just a few words, on the different things that you are wrestling with? I'd like to be able to share that with some of the parents that um, have reached out to me and, uh, frankly, are not happy with, with the answer look, we're working on it. It's difficult. We're, we're looking at a lot of things here. We're trying to make it happen, which is the truth, but it just doesn't contain enough pixels to paint the picture for them. Right. And, and as my wife says, sometimes I know you're thinking about it, but please turn on the volume and tell me what's going on. <laughs> uh, like I said, to the extent that you can, can you give us what you're wrestling with from time to time so that we can share that? Sure. I, I, uh, a, a quick one would be, you know, um, Concerns about the buses, getting kids in, you know, what effect that will have. If we can't fill a bus, can we order more buses? We'll be in competition with other schools to get more buses. If we don't win that competition, you know, are we having staggered times? Are we having kids at home? Uh, and then all the things that Jeff just said, if you do have a split classroom, what that you know, how you would deliver instruction. Sure, you know, what we're doing that. here is we're, we're, we're pointing out the bullet points here, uh, yeah. transportation issues, complexities of trying to deliver, uh, you know, pedagogy, uh, you know, basically, you know, two times over at the same time. Um, you know, a quick summary of those things, I think would paint the picture. Sure. And um, if we can't do anything, uh, if we can't make any changes in, in the present, it would at least tell people what it is we're looking at and trying to do. Yep. Yeah, I can, I can come up with something. I, I find that when I've talked Much to a few parents on the phone, you know, like I had a 25 minute conversation today talking about some of these things and, you know, you both walk away, you know, she, she gets it. Your mom gets, she gets it. She's like, yeah, I just wish it wasn't that way. So do I. <laughs> you know? And if they change a few things, we'll be good. Okay, any more, um, any more questions on the hybrid model in person, the scheduling? Okay, you Thank wanna you. move on to um, the CT program update? Yeah, that's gonna be a tag team effort with myself, Katie, and I think uh, is Dina, Tina's on, right? And Dee Clark is as well. Okay. 
Um, let me share the screen. So in your packet, I think is on page 13 or so. I just wanted to give folks, I wanted to introduce you to um, Katie uh, Bouchard is our CTE director, as you know. We also have our two engineering, we have both engineering teachers or one engineering teacher. I'll let Katie take care of that. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so uh, my part is just the first couple slides, then Katie's gonna talk about the, uh, the warehouse racking internally. And then the teachers are going to talk about um, some of the other equipment we got, and then we'll kind of roll right into the robotics first um, effort. So you may recall, um, this is where I usually have to back up three or four times. So let me start way back. We built a warehouse in the new school, <laughs> and we built a something called the Toil Lab, the Technology Office Innovation Lab, and we co-located it in an area near robotics, automation, and engineering, near advanced manufacturing, near metal fab. So last year we applied for a half a million dollars of grant funds, received 300,000. And this is just to give you an update on where, where we are with that. <clears throat> so the project that we got funded has partners. Our partner in uh, logistics engineering and robotics automation expansion is how we um, characterized it. This is phase one in my mind. Quinsigamon Community College has started a supply chain management certificate program and they have no place to actually operate the program from a hands-on point of view. So their intention and our discussion has been around uh, QCC using that space in the evening sort of like a, as a training facility. UMass Lowell continues to be part of our our uh, partnership, as well as Abel Womack is a company out of uh, Lawrence, I believe, um, and a couple of other robotic companies that are uh, signed on during the grant uh, development process, which really began about 18 months ago. Um, from a student point of view, a, a learner point of view, there's additional credentials that we will be able to supply our students. Um, Industry 4.0, I'll talk about in a second, these are in generally in the areas of me mechatronics, hydraulics, industry PLC pro programmable logic controllers, and some other equipment through Festo Didactic Company was the successful bidder. In addition, from a warehousing point of view, there are also additional credentials, um, forklift operator and, and logistics technician. These, are, these can be offered as short-term training programs through MTI. We've also talked a little bit about all the kids that are in that academy going through and getting these certificates, sort of like the OSHA 10 card, uh, that it's, it's only a, I think it's a 18 to 25 hour certificate. And then there's another organization that provides certificates in, in other areas that we're looking at as well. So it's a really, I call it phase one, um, Industry 4.0, you may have heard the term, it's uh, really the fourth industrial revolution. It involves robotics, artificial intelligence, big data, virtual reality in, in, in some applications, um, and sort of the ability to rapidly change and respond in a manufacturing environment to those things that you're learning about your production, as well as different products or systems or processes that need to be put in place. And Industry 4.0, um, you recall a year or two ago, I went to Germany and I visited some schools that were actually, you know, all focused on industry 4.0 credentialing, which uh, Festo, the company, is, is kind of a world leader in this credentialing. And you'll see their systems and their equipment in universities and colleges and in companies. Um, so, Katie, you want to talk a little bit about the this part of it? Where are you? Sure. There you are. Um, so these are some pictures of the warehouse. So over the past couple of months, um, as you can imagine, it went from just a big empty space to all of a sudden we now have some uh, racking systems that you'll see in there. Um, we have a couple more pictures there uh, on the right side of the uh, screen with the shuttle. Um, so again, this is more indoor racking. Um, it goes on both sides um, of the warehouse, which is really nice right now for additional storage. And then on the outside, um, that's the shuttle machine. Yeah, the uh, which shuttle actually is sort of a vertical warehouse. Holds yeah, a lot of stuff and can be programmed. And... 
Yep. Uh, myself, Jean, Dee, Tina, um, we all went to a training on the shuttle system, just kind of an initial get to know how it works. Uh, it's super cool. You press in like a number shelf that you want. It'll go grab the shelf, bring it down. It'll have all these different totes on the shelf and it'll actually organize whatever you're trying to store. So if you're putting back a screwdriver, it'll tell you it goes in bin six. It'll actually highlight where that bin is with a red light. You put your tool there and then you have the shelf go back up and be stored into the system, which is pretty cool. And then this is outside, um, just a lot more storage area for the racking. And then we have um, Tina Collins, who is our robotics teacher, who's going to be uh, speaking about some of the industry recognized uh, certifications. Oh, thank you, Katie. So yep. To uh, piggyback onto what Dr. Quillen was talking about for certifications, by the end of February, we've already started um, getting trained ourselves to be able to certify the students. By the end of February, we'll be able to um, certify four out of the nine certifications. One of them's um, on the line item electricity, even though you say eight line items there, electricity has two. So we'll have four out of the nine. Um, by the end of uh, February to be able to train the students. Two students have started this week um, the training for electricity and they should be able ready to test by uh, the end of the year. And the students are very, very excited about it. And they're already starting to use a lot of the new equipment, the hydraulics. And um, when Anthony comes around with an open house the other day, we actually had some of the, uh, a, a couple of circuits open and, and, and families loved it. and the kids are super excited. The energy is exciting for everything. We're still in the process. There was a lot of equipment of commissioning some of the equipment and making sure that, thank you, uh, we have everything um, that was on, that came with the grant. So the students are helping organize that, uh, categorize that. And it's, it's very exciting. The vision's excellent. Um, when I was in industry, I had heard of Festo. Um, I know it, it's in, in, in the Honda Corporation. So it, I'm, I'm excited to be a part of this. Great, thank you, Tina. Any questions about that? How do I do this in my own house? <laughs> <laughs> Very I'd expensive. Be, I'd love to be able to put the the screwdriver back in the right bin. <laughs> oh, that'd be uh, perfect. All right. Um, uh, Michael. <laughs> sure. Um, I'd like to take a step back and ask uh, for an accurate way of saying in one sentence, this is the combination of science, technology, artificial intelligence, electronics that allows X corporation or X industry to do Y fantastic things you don't even know about and produce Z products or, or Z timing, timing to delivery. Uh, this is the way the business world works and this is what we're teaching our kids. Um, so this next slide, uh, Deanna Clark is joining us as well. She is our engineering teacher uh, and she's also the advisor for the STEM and Robotics First Club. Excuse me. Hi, everyone. Um, like Katie said, my name's uh, Dee, and I'm really excited uh, to be here and tell you guys a little bit about um, our new FIRST Robotics competition team, um, which is also a combination with like a STEM club as well as um, a revamp of the existing Girls in STEM club. Um, <clears throat> so FIRST is this really awesome program. I've actually been participating since I was a junior in high school. Um, so this will be my 10th season and my eighth as a mentor. Um, and it's actually what led me to do education. So it's, it's such a really special program and it's so inspiring and impactful. And it's what made me want to be an engineer when I was in high school. So it's really cool to be able to bring that to our Minuteman students as well. Um, so FIRST, which is actually an acronym that stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology, um, is a worldwide competitive robotics program um, for students in grades nine through 12. So basically how it works is starting in January each season, um, teams are tasked with building a robot to play a specific game. Um, and the games are very involved. There's really high level strategy. Um, and in addition to really challenging mechanical design, um, 
pieces, there's also programming, electrical and wiring. Um, it brings so many different um, aspects to it, which is what one of the reasons I love it so much. Um, and so in a non COVID year, right, um, we build the robot and then we go out to local and regional and then, you know, all the way to the worldwide competition, which is held in Detroit, uh, Michigan. Um, but for this year, um, it's a little bit different. So they've kind of modified the game to be a things that you can really do at home or in small social distance groups. Um, so we're going to be taking advantage of um, some of the advisory periods um, with each grade for the students that are interested. Um, and then a little bit about the girls in STEM revamp. Um, so we're going to be incorporating this really awesome organization called Girl Up um, into the FRC team. And it's going to kind of be a sub team to provide that safe space um, for girls to um, really support each other in STEM and, you know, talk about some of the struggles that we face and how we can um, empower each other and rise above and, you know, really defend that gender equality in the STEM world. Um, and what's cool about Girl Up being a United Nations organization is you have this really cool ability to reach um, literally people worldwide. Um, I helped start up a Girl Up club um, based in Littleton. And one of the cool projects we did was if we we were challenged to raise $1,000 and then that $1,000 went to build a classroom for refugee girls in Uganda. So it's some a group you'd never be able to interact with and it's cool to be able to make that worldwide impact while supporting each other. Um, so I'm really excited about all these different um, components and what we're gonna bring. Um, so we've actually already gotten started. Um, we had an information session last week and I was so excited. There were um, about 25 kids there from seven, diff seven different shops and our numbers are just going up um, when their friends find out, oh, I wanna get involved. So it's this really great way to kind of bring um, our shops together in a time where we're a little bit divided, even when we're in person, you know, we gotta stay in our shop. So it, it's really kind of, I think, gonna unify us a little bit and we're gonna build an awesome robot and compete and it's gonna be great. So um, yeah, I think that uh, really kind of covers the uh, program. Do people have uh, specific questions or I think there was a video we wanted to play as well. Yeah, I don't have that. Uh, I have it if people, um, <laughs> I can share it. If, if, if not, we can skip it too though, whatever works. <laughs> yeah, how long is it? Um, it's three, uh, two minutes. Yeah, I watched it. And yeah, we want to see it. Okay. Do you have uh, the ability to share your screen? I would love to see it. Let me see if I can, yeah. Oh, Julia, looks like can I can. you give D? So um, this is the basically the game animation for kind of the challenge that we got this year. So we're going to be building a robot to uh, play this game. Do you have the ability to share? Is the sound coming through? The sound is, but you're going to have to go up and right click. Uh, where is it? What, when you go to share screen. You go up onto the three dots on the far right and you share computer sound, do that. Okay. And then uh, make sure you click on the screen that's showing that. There we go. Know. Okay, thank you. There you go. All right, perfect. Infinite recharge. An incoming asteroid shower is aimed at First City. Using Alliance droids, Planetary citizens collect and score power cells while traversing the trench run and boundaries to ensure maximum protection with an operational shield generator. Droids start on an initiation line and may be preloaded with up to three power cells. Droids operate autonomously during the first 15 seconds in an attempt to score power cells into any of their three available power ports. While every power cell deposited adds equal charge to the shield generator, higher power ports earn more points. Drivers then control their droids for 2 minutes and 15 seconds of teleoperated time. Power cells are collected from one of the five chutes in the loading bay and then driven across the city to be scored in the low, outer, and inner ports. Droids must score the required number of power cells to activate sections of their shield generator and then either rotate their control panel a specified number of times or position it to a specific color. 
Near the end of the match, droids race to their rendezvous point to make their shield generator operational. Alliances are awarded bonus points for a level generator switch. The alliance that earns the most points wins the match. May the force be with us all. Wow, I am in awe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fun, huh? Yeah, it's going to be a blast. The kids are really excited about it. Awesome. Uh, so any um, any questions or comments? Judy has a question. Judy. Yeah. Um, thank you. That looks, I wish I had that in high school. <laughs> um, could I ask, so you have so far 25 students. Would that be one team or would it be break up into different teams? Yeah, so that, that's one team. Um, and basically kind of how we're breaking up is everyone's, we're gonna have a bunch of sub teams. So you have like your CAD and design, your manufacturing, your programming, your electrical. And then um, even on the non-technical side, um, you also, you know, first teams are encouraged to do a lot of community outreach um, and mentoring of younger robotics teams like middle school level. So there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for growth in both the technical and the non-technical areas. And it's really cool because then every student kind of has their little piece of the pie, their leadership role that they're responsible for contributing. So it really is a full team effort. Yeah, team is definitely the word. Um, and my last question, please, is um, do you, does the team have a name? Is it just Minuteman or I saw there was a number there? <laughs> yeah, so um, the kids are throwing around some names. I think Winitman is one of them, um, <laughs> which is a good one. Um, Minute Made Robotics, like maybe oh. something with the lemonade. Um, <laughs> I don't know. But um, so I'm going to, once we kind of get like that full roster, I'm going to have them decide and vote because I really want it to be something they brand and, and, and make their own as like the founding members. But I, I think Winitman or Minute Made Robotics are in the mix right now as like the top contenders. <laughs> well, enjoy. This sounds Thank like you. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. I'm excited. Thank you. Any other questions and or comments? Well, thank you, Tina. Thank you. Yeah. Dee. Yes, thank you, Katie, Tina, D. We so appreciate you coming, taking the time to come tonight, and your presentations. What you're doing is just awesome. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Glad to be here. <laughs> Take Saturday off. <laughs> How nice of you. <laughs> okay, moving on to finance report. Um, who is going to start? Uh, Steve's gonna start. Yeah, I, I can kick it off. Uh, finance committee uh, met last Monday and uh, we uh, reviewed the uh, latest iteration of the superintendent's budget, uh, which I think will be presented uh, to you right now. Uh, I, 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 in general, the um, uh, the finance committee is supportive of the recommended budget, but we wanted to uh, get a little feedback from the rest of the committee. So uh, uh, I, I believe Ed will be walking the presentation through and then we'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks. So, uh, oh, I'm getting good at this, huh? There's no music or anything with this, but. <laughs> So the theme last year was managing our success. This year, we're talking about preparing for reality. So just a reminder to the to the, the committee is that, you know, COVID had impacts this year on our FY21 budget. We were one of the fortunate regional schools that had a fully approved budget before July 1 and didn't have to go through the 112th budget challenge. But we did have to reduce staff. We had increased costs with PPE. We had to adapt transportations, adapt to remote learning. I think adapt is probably the bumper sticker there. Um, we did put in some additional enhancements with a nurse and additional counseling on call. And then the state had different requirements um, as we went along. I call you back later. Uh, we did eliminate. Um, community okay. education. Uh, excuse me, Ed, um, if you're not speaking, could you please put yourself on mute? Thank you. Um, we did eliminate community ed, which was our, you know, avocational programs in the evening. Um, and we've had no rental income. The school-wide goals for 21-22 are, are, have pretty much been the same goals we've had for eight or nine years. Um, they get reviewed every year, 
you know, wordsmithing sounds like we don't do some important thinking about it, but we do. Um, and obviously our number one goal is a healthy campus. Um, assumptions that we made going forward for this budget is that we believe COVID is gonna be with us at the fall, in the fall of 2021. We're gonna to have to have some form of remote learning or hybrid learning in place. Um, we don't really know what the state and federal funding is gonna be, we're hopeful. Um, we're gonna get the MSBA bonding completed. We're gonna finish borrowing for the, the big school project. We do have a situation that we know is gonna continue where we have more applications than we do space. We're beyond the design enrollment capacity less than a year into the building. So Jeff alluded to the 800 capacity plan and it's gonna be a cost effective way to increase um, enrollment. Overall, the budget uh, the operating budget is, is up very responsibly, only 2.4%. Um, our capital obviously is where we've had the big increases, but those increases especially when it comes to the project debt, have been increases we've been telling the towns about for years, literally years. And we're pretty much right on, right on what we said it would cost. The only addition to all that has been the athletic field uh, alternate lighting. And as we know, we're a, a few days away from having that approved by virtue of non-disapproval. Uh, this budget, the FY22 budget, I believe, funds our priorities. Uh, protecting student and safety, uh, staff health, also adding the, uh, the animal science program and expanding the logistics engineering program that we just talked about. In this FY22 budget, there is a full-time logistics engineering uh, position funded and a full-time animal science uh, vet assisting program. So, so this is a little bit more detail about the capital debt budget impacts. This first one really has to do with the bonding for the, the fields, as well as continuing to pay our ESCO lease down. Um, and then the school building debt service, uh, we're hoping to, or we're not hoping, we will at some point in the fiscal year, and at some point in this calendar year, go out for final borrowing to complete the project. And this budget also, you remember our, 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 uh, our handy dandy capital stabilization fund, which we originally created six years ago in order to fund what we believed would have been an, an underfunded equipment budget based upon the MSBA formula. The MSBA formula is the same for FF&E, furniture, fixtures, equipment. It's like $1,200 or $1,400 a kid whether you're in a middle school, an elementary school, or a vocational school. So we put over the years money into that. We have almost 1.3 million in there now, which you voted back in June to put towards the fields. So um, this funds an additional $260,000 back into the capital stabilization fund to begin putting aside money and maybe using it for the cap uh, 800 capacity plan. Some of the big drivers in the budget was obviously we're in year two of a three-year collective bargaining agreement. So Ed, can I just interrupt? So the, yep. the whole issue of the um, not having the MSBA funding, we got a grant to fund that. It wasn't that MSBA all of a sudden decided to fund it. No, you know, with all okay. the kindness so, in my heart, we had, to, we had to take care of ourselves. Right. No, I just wanted to clarify yeah. that it... It didn't. It wasn't the manna from heaven that all of a sudden MSBA decided that vocational tech deserved something that it wasn't allocating. Um, I, ju I just want to be clear that it's where why the funding came through ultimately. It came through through five different grants right. over four fiscal years. No, it was amazing. Total. I just I yeah. I want to make it clear for the people that weren't on the board at the time where where right. that money came from. Right. Thank you. Oops. Uh, one thing that bothers me to no end is why our heat electrical and heat utility costs are running so high. Part of it's COVID because, you know, the building is empty. We're running the HVAC at a much higher C CFM, you know, cubic foot per minute, as has been recommended. We don't have enough bodies creating their own BTUs. So 
I don't know, but this bothers me. We're looking into it constantly because um, this is above what we said we would be paying for utilities. Um, also, maintenance contracts on our new equipment. We found that it was cheaper to contract with the manufacturers um, to maintain some of the higher tech new HVAC related equipment. Um, and it also keeps our warranties moving forward. Our property insurance went up. Obviously, we're in a, a building that has slightly more value than the other one. We did realize a, a decrease in health insurance. This is my 14th or 15th budget. I've never said that before. <laughs> but it's because there's a net reduction in, in staffing still. And our transportation is under because we had originally bid higher. And Bob and our, one of our consultants got more competitive bidding which was below what we had budgeted. So that's a good thing. This is admissions and enrollment. You've heard this story before. Um, we're up to 215 applications in the far year of graduation to 2025. Um, you can see the out of district applications are up around 57 right now, I think. No, maybe they're more than that, but it, we're still experiencing you know, wonderful interest in Minuteman. Need to keep it keep it up for sure. Our special ed enrollments are running the way they normally do. About 46% of the kids are on an IEP. These are budget drivers that I'm talking about. Enrollment admissions priorities is sustain our member enrollment. Uh, change perceptions, continue to work on what we just talked about. Increased video content, Dan kind of worked through this. One of the things we're doing in the middle school is something called the WOW program, World of Work, uh, which will get us down into the sixth and seventh grade. And because of the change in the Carl Perkins law that went into effect this past fiscal year, we can use our Perkins money in the middle schools to a greater degree, degree than we could before for career development. So we're gonna use that to support our marketing and missions enrollment goals. This is another overview of the operating and capital increases you can see. Although that's a small amount of, I'm pointing at it, you can't see it. I have to go like this, okay. It's a big percentage, but it's not a huge amount of money, but this is where the big money is in the, in the building project. These are the components that um, create the assessment to the member towns. And it's listed in a way that um, town managers like to see. You can see that the, we are still charging the non-member towns, the ex-members, the former members for that. So it's fun to send them a bill, especially when it's for non-resident tuition. And it's really fun when it's a capital fee. So these are just looking a few years out you know, the school project debt payments, so I think are peaking in FY23, not much more than they are now, but they will. Um, we're looking at this year decreases in state aid and reimbursements. Uh, because of the increase in, me in member town enrollment, the minimum local contributions from the member towns are going to increase by nature of the chapter 70 formula. And as we talked about earlier, we're, we're planning on a decrease in non-member revenue, but um, we'll see. But I think it's best to plan, uh, plan for the worst. That's, that's it. Uh, that concludes. Are there any questions? There are a lot. I see Jeff. OK, a few comments. Uh, one comment is that um, it is possible that officials in a number of member towns may be unhappy with their assessment this year. Uh, and the, the primary reasons they're going to be unhappy with it because they're sending more students and they're sending them at, at uh, a full freight because we have fewer out of district. And secondly, because the debt is, uh, the debt level is approaching its uh, maximum. I'm happy to defend this, though, as long as our debt levels match our expectations. We've, we've told about them for years, and I believe that they do. So despite uh, I expect some unhappiness, uh, I, I, I'm not unhappy. 
Uh, I mean, it, it would be best, of course, if uh, assessments were lower and the state did more of their responsibility, but this is the way it is. And I do expect to have some uh, pushback because of these numbers, but I'm uh, perfectly happy to uh, be able to discuss these things with people and say, this is what we told, what we told you and, and um, you agreed to, and look at the great building and look at all your students who are taking advantage of it. And we're gonna have to have that discussion, I think in some of our towns. Um, I wanna also point out that in this year, despite COVID, there are a few uh, 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 very important opportunities that you're taking advantage of, which I consider like, um, I don't know, icing on the cake is not the right term. It's beyond that. I'm referring both to the athletic fields and our compromise on the athletic fields that I'm very happy with, and the possibility of raising enrollment to 800 at a relatively low cost. And what I wanna point out is that the reason that we can do that is because of um, good prior decisions and good management. Decisions and management that happened many years ago have led to the, the, the time in which we can take advantage of these opportunities if we choose to do so. I'm extremely happy to see that. And the third comment is that um, maybe COVID will have an impact in the fall. You have to plan for it. But uh, uh, Mr. Half Cup Empty here is still saying maybe not. Maybe in the fall, we will really be at the point in which we, yeah, there's gonna be some lingering impacts, but we are um, basically beyond it. I'm, hope, I'm hoping, but you, you got to plan the other way. I understand it. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jennifer. So I think a 2.5 or 2.4 percent increase in the operating budget is something I can sell to, to my town. I, I, yes. My town's asking for a 5 percent decrease in everybody's operating budget, but they're not expecting that from school systems. But I think that that is a really reasonable number. I mean, I think the capital we've known about for years, we also know about the field project. We just went through that. I'm really impressed with what the administration has come forward with to, to make this palatable to our, to our towns. I think, you know, going forward for Lancaster, I think the one thing is sharing some of this responsibility with other our other member communities. But I, I think this is something I can sell. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Alice. Um, I agree with Jennifer. I think it's a very uh, understandable budget. I like it. 2.4% um, operating increase is easy to talk about. I also think it would be worth when we talk about the budget with them, um, you and Including that some of your uh, just the presentation just before when you talk about the new technical uh, shops and stuff, mm -hmm. because um, I think if we generate some excitement in the select board about what they're supporting with the budget, I think they would be really excited to, um, you know, it's, it wouldn't just be, oh, here's a budget. It'd be more like we are really behind this really exciting thing, you know? So I would, I would encourage you to share that as well. Yeah, as we get towards, as we start building our town meeting presentations, which, you know, we try to customize it with that, with kids from the town. And we're, we're kind of, I think we're better prepared this year for that. Certainly Dan's work has, has given us a lot of, a lot of B-roll. <laughs> yeah. Other questions or comments? Uh, Judy. Thank you. Um, first budget with you, Ed, so thank you so much. I appreciate this. Um, 2.4, I think, is very palatable. Um, so thank you for your diligence in getting this together. Um, again, first time of the budget process for Minuteman. So um, I'm just going to ask one preliminary question. When you're looking at the assessment components, um, mm -hmm. I noticed that even though this year, uh, because of negotiation, you had a decrease in the transportation um, line item. But um, for FY21 to 22, there's um, a, a little bit of a hike. Um, you're anticipating because of growing enrollment. Um, a, hike, a hike in what exactly? 
the transportation assessment? Um, for Lexington or for overall? No, overall, uh, slide 14. Um, yes, right there. It was the 39 plus percent. I think, Bob, do you, can you uh, see that? Yes, I can. Um, and I'm going to pull up a spreadsheet. The transportation, uh, the hike in transportation is a result of our um, assessment formula. And um, while we use the four year rolling average, the increases in student attendance are what are increasing the assessment portion of that. Um, so I guess that's the easiest way I can explain it. When we have the budget book, you'll see the assessment page and you can see the formulas as to how the transportation and operation assessment share was calculated. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a formula based uh, calculation that we use. Okay. But were we, we were penalized because we did not pay as much last year's. Yeah, our reimbursement right? is gonna be less because we so didn't we, spend as much. Right, uh, so that we're penalized this year for that, right? Yes, and also the foundation budget requirements went up for our member districts. Um, so the state, the state is expecting our member districts to pay more as far as the minimum assessment. And then uh, it doesn't quite impact our transportation assessment because at least we have the rolling average to help that. But that is really impacted by just student enrollment. Okay. Yeah, so this is the net piece. So our, we spend 1.3 million or so, 1.12 or something on transportation. And we're assuming, I think, a 67% reimbursement rate. Right. So, um, yeah, when you couple the addition, the, re, the added requirement for minimum local contribution, what we got for less, not spending as much this year, um, it does bump up. But we're hearing we're going to get 80%. So who knows? We might be all right by the time June comes around. But of course, we've been hearing. Have you been dreaming? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, but not Thank today. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, get Jennifer uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be the glasses half full, but I'm, I'm heart. Well, you and Jeff balance out. So just. <laughs> Well, right. um, thank you for that explanation. You can see how I, it just kind of, for me, jumps out of the page a little bit. Um, yeah, well, we're happy to go over it with you, you know, one on one, go yeah, through it you. before town meeting. Um, and I think that it actually helps for each town to go through this for their own, because every number is very different and each number is tweaked a little bit for each town based on what's happening in the state and in the in the district. So I think it helps if each of us reach out to Bob and Ed and say what's happening for us specifically so we can talk to our member communities. Yeah, thank you for that reminder, Jennifer. Um, let's see, I have no, I, uh, were you done, Judy, or did you have more? Just one more question, please. So um, you did mention um, the budget book. Mm -hmm. So is that something that every member um, can get? Yeah, we, we print, well, I don't know how many we'll print this year, but we usually print in several thousand because when we go to a town meeting, yeah, we, uh, and I think in, in Lexington, we actually send it out on a PDF through the town meeting member listserv. So I guess my question is, um, because that's still in draft form, so once we approve the budget, we would all receive a copy? Oh yeah, we'll probably have a draft for uh, the, the public hearing. Terrific, yeah. in two weeks, okay. In two weeks, Thank yeah. Thank you. Thank so you. On, on that question, how soon do we want to communicate this information? We want to wait until the next meeting, until the budget hearing meeting? Well, no. we do have a um, FinCon meeting coming up before yes. the school committee meeting. Uh, you know, my hope is that we have the budget book or a draft of the budget book and the proposal prepared for FinCom so that you can see it. Uh, and definitely we have to have it before the budget hearing. So at the bare minimum. Well, I'm just asking because this is this is a public hearing, so or a public meeting. So this not these numbers are out. So yeah, I sent I sent them to all the town managers. Okay. I sent them to you, and then about eight hours later, I sent them to all the town managers. Yeah. Okay, because I just I, I our FinCom tends to be the the most powerful financial group in mm -hmm. the in the town, and I'd like 
I don't want them to feel slighted. Yeah, so I said Arlington smelling salts with theirs. So, <laughs> so are we free to send these to people, or is this? Do yeah. we want to wait till the budget? But okay, thank you. No, no, no. Yeah, as long as you underline it's preliminary. Right, I'm good with that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jeff. Uh, a practical question for Ed. Do you believe that the towns have their act together sufficiently that we will have our uh, budget by the um, appropriate time this year? Last year it was like oh. cliffhanger. So do we have to like push in these people a little bit or do you think that they understand it better now? It, it really won't matter to us. I mean, some of you probably know better when you're holding your town meetings. I know Lexington last year was the first one who really did an online remote town meeting. I mean, I was on some of those first few painful <laughs> sessions. Well, we did a good job. Come on, come on. I, I tell you, by the time it was done, it, amazing. Yeah. But I heard some towns like Concord, you're not going to, you pushed it out till June now? Middle of the middle of June, because they want to do it on the football field in nice weather. So. And yeah. Lexington is March 22nd is when we begin. Right. Yeah, I think Acton is pushing it out to June as well. So what, what is our date that we have to have this done by? Well, June 30th. June 30th. Yeah. I think we'll be okay. We're, you know, I think last year, eight of the nine towns voted before July, June 30th. So the only one that didn't was, was it Concord? Concord. Yeah. Ahead in September. Alice has a question. Oh, I'm just reading oh, the lip. It was just. <laughs> no, no, you're back on mute. You can use the chat. So, just to go over the process. Oh, hold on. Alice is off mute now. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, there's something wrong with my system. Um, I was just going to say, Stowe was very late, and I have no idea this year. Okay. Any other questions on the budget? We'll have the budget hearing, which will be in a webinar format. Um, and, you know, who knows if we'll have people who ask questions or not. I, we usually have a small handful. We'll adjourn from the public hearing and then we'll have a regular, um, albeit shortened, school committee meeting where you would vote the budget. So here's a question. Do you, I, I could have my FinCom, my director of finance on that budget hearing. She doesn't show up in Lex Lexington when we usually have them in person, but would you prefer her to be there for any questions? We you know what we're used to is going to your town and spending time and, with just yeah, right. them okay so we can answer their questions specifically yeah okay. i mean we try to get all that done before the public hearing we're a little bit earlier than we were last year with the public hearing but so if you can get uh us onto a meeting you know so we don't okay. have to drive all over the place now this is great you know <laughs> some ways well nobody has to go to lexington which makes people from lancaster happy but yeah so okay so i will i will notify cheryl that we're having this on the 26th and then um hopefully we can have all her questions answered before the hearing at all thank you it'd be great yeah so and in, in the officers and i are working on the agenda for that business meeting if you will where we'll take care of the pv contract um and some other items Oh, can I have one point more? Can we send the budget thing just as a separate PDF so that we can I can forward that to her or to the, the presentation? Income? You mean? Yeah, exactly. Because yes. it's part of the it's part of the school committee packet. Can you just send yep. it as a, pri a separate thing? Thank you. I'll send it to Julia now, and she can uh, send it to the entire school committee again. Okay. Um, did, did you have another question? I did just a follow-up, please. Just for something, the conversation thread that you and um, that and Jennifer were having. So, um, so we anticipated that we have one public hearing and then we vote immediately after the for the the public hearing. 
Correct. I ask, is there any reason why we need to do it so quickly in case yes. there were questions from the public hearing that needed to be, you know, um, digested? Um, <laughs> we need to do it quickly because it's in our regional agreement. Uh, because Lexington moved it earlier, we originally were going to have it in February, but we I think it's 60 days before the first town meeting, we have to have our budget approved by the school committee, which and in order to have it approved by the school committee, we need to go through a public mm -hmm. hearing. Okay. No, the public hearing, I understand. I just didn't know we voted immediately after a public hearing. So, so thank you. So, that was clarifying, just clarifying. Thank you so much. Well, Judy, I think this is important for you to, because Lexington is the reason we need to do this so quickly. Right. So sorry, folks. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's All not right. your fault. We used to have Belmont, so it's not your fault. Um, Lincoln. No, oh Lincoln. I'm sorry. So you just need to make sure you communicate to your people between now and the 26th what's in that fly, what's what's in that document, so you you can have the questions you need answered at that public hearing. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So okay. that we can we can make sure that whatever their concerns are are addressed before we vote. The other thing I would add is that it's a, a long and rigorous process. The FinCom has seen uh, multiple iterations of this budget. Um, this is actually version nine. Dr. McQuillan's really worked hard to get it down to a 2.4% increase in the operating budget. It started out um, well over that. So um, the process is to work with our FinCom first, bring it to our school committee now so you have chances to think about it. And, and then get the budget passed. Yeah, no, thank you. This is, again, I'm still on that learning curve. So thank you all for, for the helpful hints. <laughs> okay, um, any other questions? Um, I see um, Jennifer Hewitt, you have a question. Could you, since this is not part of public comment, could you put it in the chat? Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Steve, anything else that you want to? No, just to reiterate what uh, Jennifer said, uh, you know, I, I work with Ed for a lot of years uh, as a town manager. And, uh, you know, every every year I was always amazed at how how well put together a Minuteman budget was, and it still continues that way. And he does a terrific job, he and, he and Bob. So very happy with the, the work they've done. Thank you. Okay. Um, shall we move on to subcommittee reports? Um, policy. Am I off mute? You're all set. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's it's a lot of, of policies, but I think we can get through them in a very routine manner. Um, I want to uh, give uh, Dr. Perot the floor first because she's going to speak about the policy archiving, which is what we all wanted for Christmas. Okay, um, hi everyone. So, um, if you've been on the Minuteman website at all recently to the school committee um, section or page, you'll see it's been um, updated. Dan um, O'Brien and Julia did an amazing job in a very short amount of time um, organizing it, getting it up to date. It's very um, streamlined and a little bit more user friendly. You can find the information you're looking for and all the information you're looking for, minutes or agendas, they all are in the same format now and they kind of all look consistent. Um, it looks like a much more sort of professional put together website and they both did a great job on that. The policy section of it is the same. Um, so right now our online policy manual is completely up to date. Um, the paper copies um, that Julia has is the uh, actually the official policy um, book is hard copy and Julia has that, that's up to date. Alice has our backup official paper copy and that's up to date now. 
Um, and then moving forward, we have a few things on the docket where we're going to um, take the policy manual that we have now that's a PDF on the website um, and work to get it in a more interactive way using OneNote, which is what we use to archive the minutes for all the subcommittee meetings and the um, main school committee meeting as well. So you'll be able to search for a policy either by name or by function code, and it'll bring you right to that document. It'll make it much, um, again, more streamlined and quicker and um, easier to use. I'm really excited. I'm excited about how much work um, Dan and Julia have been able to do in such a short amount of time. It already looks better. It already is easier to use um, and just continuing to move forward in that process. It's, it's gonna, gonna be great. As exciting as a policy manual can get, it's gonna be great. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Dr. Perot. And I wanna just say again, how happy I am that that is the case because now we can move on and we can kind of start moving through the policies again, which is really important. So um, we're going through section I and we're um, comparing the policies in section I to the ones in MASC and seeing where we're missing policies, where ours are out of date, which, you know, things like that. Um, that's a, a big effort by Judy, especially. Um, Judy is a rock star with um, documents. So just so you know. Um, and then <clears throat> we have tonight three from section J and one from section B. So in order to get through these in an orderly fashion, um, we're gonna start with section J. We have three policies that used to kind of be all rammed into the homeless policy, which was very old. So if you start around page 43 or so, I think, Hang on. Oh, 44. Yeah. 44. Okay. So that first one there is um, homeless students. The original one, JFABD, that we have is something from 2011 or 2009. It's really old. It's down on page 50 something. Uh, 50. Yeah, 50. So <clears throat> if you, that's the old one. You can see that it was updated in 2011. So it kind of covered a little bit of the other two policies in J that we're looking at now, it, but not really in a thorough manner. And MASC went and updated um, their policies in 2019. So what we want to do first is we want to um, take a motion. By the way, I received no comments on any of these. Um, we want to take a motion to approve uh, the first of these, which is... Um, I'm, hang on, <laughs> I'm getting there. Uh, J-F-A-B-D, homeless enrollment <laughs> rights and services. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, so now we can talk about it. Um, okay, Jeff, you have a question. I have um, an observation. Mm -hmm. So um, whenever we uh, uh, do these, po a lot of these policies, and I kind of uh, initially dread going to them because they're dense, there's a lot of words, a lot of them are in things that I, I don't have any expertise in, and, it, and it's hard to do. But what usually happens, and happened today more than normal, is I go through it and I say, gee, this really is astonishingly important. I never thought of some of these things. So each of these things means there's an incident that somebody observed of something wrong and they had to put in the policy. Uh, and I'm looking especially on this one, uh, JFABD, and all the items that it, it covers. Uh, sharing the housing of other persons, living in motels, hotels, trailer parks, living in emergency transitional shelters, being abandoned in hospitals, living in public or private places, uh, not designed for ordinary use as sleeping accommodations, living in cars, parks, migratory children, living in conditions described in the previous examples. And then I wake up a little bit when I see this stuff, geez. This stuff is uh, a, 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 a painful to go through, but it just struck me of how important it is for especially some of these policies to make a statement as to how we are supposed to be treating these children. 
So that's just an observation today when I was spending a, you know, a couple of hours preparing for this meeting that, you know, got kind of got me energized to finish reading through them and then finishing the minutes. And I think that every once in a while, it's, it's useful to reflect on that. And that's, I just wanted to, because it came up in my mind today to bring it up. I have no problem with any of these policies. So I'm just brought that up. That's it. Done. Any other questions or comments? Okay, are we ready to move to a roll call vote? Oh, wait, no, uh, Michael. Uh, it, it just occurred to me that if we agree with what Jeff just said, that we are, are all in agreement uh, on, on all of them, can we move them together as, as one vote? Um, it depends on whether you, anybody might have a question about foster care or... <coughs> Military children. I mean, it, I would have to redo my motion. I think we're going to take more time yeah. talking about that right. than we will taking the yeah. votes. Right. Yeah. It, okay. It's a little tedious, but I think we should go through them one by one. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, we'll start the roll call. Pam Nurse Acton, yes. Uh, Michael Ruderman, Arlington, yes. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Warren Spalding, Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone, Lancaster, yes. Judy Crocker, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen, Needham, yes. Alice DeLuca Stowe, yes. Thank you very much. And thank you to Dr. Perot for bringing us policy, which we're essentially ready to vote on instantly. So the next one is JFABE. We're going to also vote to at the end of this to remove the existing one for that homeless thing. JFABE, this is about military children. Um, I don't believe there are a, num a large number of children who are military families, but military families tend to move around a lot. The kids get moved around. And um, this is uh, new um, in the MASC roster of policies. <clears throat> we should get a motion to approve JFABE for first reading. I will move and should we do in the same motion, remove the previous one? No, there was no previous one. They didn't have oh, okay. one. Okay, so I will yeah. move to accept this one. Second. Great. Any discussion? Okay, let's move to a roll call. Pam Nersankton, yes. Michael Ruderman, Arlington, yes. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Ward Smalling, Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone, Lancaster, yes. Judy Crocker, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen, Needham, yes. Alice DeLuca Stowe, yes, thank you again. The next one is JFABF. This one is for educational opportunities for children in foster care. Um, again, a separate group of children, not homeless, not military, but in a special situation. Um, and again, this is MASC October 2019. We should get a motion for first reading. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? So I have one question about this is that if the children move out of foster care, what, how does that affect their ability to stay in the district? I tried to read it, but I didn't, I didn't understand there that. That's caveat. for row, I think. Okay. Yeah, um, they get to finish their year. Okay. So if um, for educational stability, if they are in foster care in and in Minuteman and then they move out or they move out of district, um, they finish the year that they're in and then they would enroll in their um, new school of origin. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's do a roll call. Pam Narsankton, yes. Michael Ruderman, Arlington, yes. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Ford Smalding, Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone, Lancaster, yes. Judy Crocker, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen, Needham, yes. Alice to Lucas Joe, yes. Uh, next one is JFABD, homeless students, the existing policy. We want to remove it from the manual when the second uh, reading is done. So moved. Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? Okay, let's move to a vote. Pam Nersankton, yes. Michael Ruderman, Arlington, yes. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Ford Spalding, Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone, Lancaster, yes. Judy Crocker, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen, Needham, yes. 
Alice to Lucas Joe, yes. Okay, the, the last one is BEDH. Um, section B is a section which includes a lot of things like bylaws and uh, rules of order, things like that. Um, it's all out of date. Uh, the first one we're looking at is BEDH. This is um, was emailed to you separately. Um, and it is, uh, was developed using the MASC language um, and some language from council. We have an existing BEDH policy, which is, uh, I don't think that was actually sent to you, um, but it is from 2009. <laughs> and in fact, the law that it was based on has been repealed. So we do need to update this one. <laughs> I went and looked up the references and I was like, oh my God, it's gone. So um, anyway, uh, BADH, BEDH, uh, this one is interesting because it has been reviewed um, by the school district's council. Um, and we asked them specifically to integrate into it some uh, language relating to um, online uh, meetings. So if you look in section one, uh, of it, you'll see that in the middle it says, oh no, that's not the one, sorry, section three. There's a sentence there for remote meetings, public comments will be submitted in advance to chair and relayed by the chair during the meeting. Um, and then the last one is, uh, whoops, uh, where is it? It's in the last one, eight. Um, the meeting host uh, or the meeting host for any remote at attendee. So this is an, a conglomeration of, of stuff from MASC's language, um, reviewing our own language and then having the school district council review it as well. So what we're proposing here is to um, a first reading of BEDH, this new draft, and then um, uh, we will eventually delete BEDH, the one that exists, and then we will also be coming back with some types of procedural direction for the chair to follow this policy because it's a very complicated policy and um, you need some type of procedural document that's in English. So I can move the original policy, the new policy, but do you want me to move to remove the old one? or wait until the um, second reading? Let's wait to the second reading. Okay, so I'll move that we approve this initial reading, the first okay. reading. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second to any discussion. Uh, Steve. Yeah, in, in reading uh, section six, um, I'm wondering if it makes sense if we added uh, uh, that the school committee will not vote on any item that's brought up as well, because you know it's been my experience when when people come under citizen comments, they're expecting a board to take action, and you know clearly it's not on the agenda, so we really shouldn't be taking action. So I don't know if we need to clarify and just add vote to the to the litany of of the language there. Okay, so which which section is it? Six. Okay, so not vote on any item brought up. Right, it'll be on a future agenda or whatever, right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Um, so, do we want is it to? Um, Move to the roll call vote for first reading. Uh, Pam Nurse Acton, yes. Michael Ruderman, Arlington, yes. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Ford Spalding, Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone, Lancaster, yes. Judy Crocker, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen, Needham, yes. Alice Stulen, Christo, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Alice. Judy, Amy, um, I know that this is a, a lot of work and it is very, very much appreciated. And thank you all for putting up with pra practicing our alphabetical um, litany of towns. <laughs> Maybe we'll get it down. <laughs> no, no, I won't. <laughs> my, I will not. Um, okay, secretary's report. 
Oh, okay. So at the last meeting, there's two sections of, of minutes in your packet. The last meeting, when we reviewed the minutes of the November 17th meeting, we didn't actually, we voted to, um, what did we do? Uh, oh, shoot, I forgot. We voted um, to we approve didn't, the meetings without the amendment. Yeah, we, right. We, the we, amendment, we, not the we minutes. Didn't, we didn't do the final vote. So right. we need to do the final vote to approve. That's all. I will move that we vote the final amended minutes from the, like, what's the date? Sorry. November 17th. November 17th minute meeting. Or Thanksgiving. I have a second? Second. Oh, okay. Any comments? Okay. Hamner, Sackton, yes. Michael Ruderman, Arlington, yes. Evil do, Concord, yes. Ford Spalding, Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone, Lancaster, yes. Judy Crocker, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stula, Needham, yes. Alice Stuluka, Stowe, yes. Thank you very much. The second one is the December 8th minutes. So um, I just want to remark one more time how absurd it is to be doing the um, weighted voting. It is a nightmare because, you know, if you use a boilerplate and you stamp the boilerplate in there that says 50%, 100%, whatever, you have to go in and you have to review it to make sure that that's exactly right was everybody in the room for every single vote. And I know people cared about it, but it is a nightmare. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, I didn't get any comments on these minutes. I don't know if anybody has any. None. I do. No. Uh, my, com my comment is that these minutes actually were quite complicated and they're extraordinarily well-written considering how complicated they are. Uh, that's what I noticed when I was reading through them, that there were some very complicated patches that were ex extremely well uh, well uh, written, and that really caught my attention. Uh, so that's that's my comment. Thank you. Uh, Julia does a great job. I go, I think there are something like 18 people who watch the videos of those meetings. Julia watches them. I watch them. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I had to go through this two times. Okay, so, it. all right, so... <laughs> December 8th, we need a motion to approve the minutes of December so 8th. Second. Any discussion? Okay, Pam Norsakton, yes. Michael Ruderman, Arlington, yes. People do, Concord, yes. Ford Spalding, Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone, Lancaster, yes. Judy Crocker, Lexington, yes. I know I come next only because I write down Lexington on the sheet of paper. That's the only reason <laughs> I know, just do the meeting, yes. And Alice DeLuca Stowe, yes. And these vo votes where we say our name and who we are and everything are valuable to blind people if they were to uh, see the video of our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know, and I do want to thank Julia and Alice. I know these are a lot of work and time consuming. So really appreciate it. Um, let me ask, was there a separate Zoom link that was sent out? No. For executive, what? For executive, For the session? executive session? Yes. Yes, there was. Yes, uh, there is. But I now I gotta find it. Okay. Um, I did not get that. Um, Julia or Ed, could you? I, I know. I, I don't know what the problem is. Um, could you try sending it to me again? Okay. But we need to. We need to adjourn. Not to I know, you. I know. Oh, okay. I just okay. wanted so you to want do so in... adjourned. I wanted to make sure I could get on the next meeting. Okay. We might so... ask that oh no, I got I found it. So I okay. have it. Okay. Um could we have a a motion um to enter executive um session um for the reasons printed on the agenda um to open to executive session return to open session wait are we returning to open session yes we are return to open session for the following reason to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel namely the superintendent director dr edward Wilm. Um, I have a, 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 actually a, a procedural comment. The, um, uh, the item nine does not say that we're going to move in back to open session and, and take any action. Oh, it doesn't? It does oh, not. Crap. 
So I don't think that we can take any action in open session <sighs> until our next meeting. Right. It does not say so in the agenda. That's correct. Right, hold on. I agree. I agree. You're right. Okay, so I am perfectly willing to have this executive session. We can make the motions or you make the plans that we want and then not even have an executive session the next meeting in two weeks. Is everybody yeah, good think, with that? I think that, that's what we should go ahead and do. Um, I'm sorry about this. I, I, I thought it would be to return, but we can put it on the first thing on the, on the regular minutes before the budget here or after, well, but after the budget hearing. We can have it at any time. We don't need to go, I don't think we need to go into executive session after what we said last. No, we don't. No, it just has to be, but I think the budget hearing is scheduled for a specific time. So I think we need to do yeah. it after the budget right hearing. After the that, budget. That's right. At the school committee meeting that follows the budget hearing. Yes, exactly. Okay. Can I ask one question of the chair? Yes. Are you sure we're not going to need an executive session next time? Uh, you know, I'm not sure we're not going to, but probably not for this not reason. For this. In fact, we may need one for another for other reasons. I agree. So okay. I'm not at this. Um, so I think that the point was for. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So could I have the motion to enter executive session and not return? So to open session? Second. Seconded. Uh, okay. Actually, I think we should read it again. Okay. Uh, and I will do so just to, you know, I'll talk fast. I, I, I move to enter executive session and not to return to open session for the following reasons. Uh, to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiation with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, namely as the superintendent director, Dr. Ed Wood Boquillen, and who do we want to remain with us? Nobody oh. needs to be here with us. I think we're done. Nobody needs to be here with us. Um, well, actually, oh. it, um, uh, it is uh, Julia's um, Zoom link. Oh, well, no. Oh, well. Okay, so Julia. So I think we need to at least have Julia to join the meeting to open the Zoom link. Okay. I think you can transfer ownership to you. Yes, after, after we open it. With uh, Julia. That's fine. We'll start out with it at any rate. Okay, so that's the motion. Second. Just, okay, so, um, second. So any any discussion on that? Okay. Pam Nurse Acton, yes. Michael Ruderman Arlington, yes. Steve Ledoux Concord, yes. Ford Spalding Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone Lancaster, yes. Judy Crocker Lexington, yes. Jeff Stula Needham, yes. Alice Lucas Joe, yes. 